Today I'm here with Roger Barton, uh, author of Waiting for the Rains. And you have another one as well, don't you? Yes, uh, my second book. Okay. Um, we, so we met at Books and Beverages, uh, a library event in Harrogate, uh, where mm -hmm. you gave a, a talk about your experiences in Africa, which were the basis of these books. And uh, so I invited you here today and just to sort of discuss a little bit of that and share some of it with, uh, with our audience, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I guess um, if we could just start from the beginning and, uh, and sort of what was the process and how did you actually get the, the position that you had in Africa? And uh, to, to be honest, it was quite straightforward. And advertisement, like all things, sometimes come from very small beginnings. And uh, a nice one advertisement. Uh, in one of the local papers for a position in Malawi uh, in um, in Africa and uh, uh, it was for uh, to be a training officer in their government uh, printing office uh, and went through the a very lengthy uh, interview procedure I have to say this is this is my first encounter back there so it, it's going back into the 70s here and um, it was a lengthy process. They wanted to make sure this was a bit more before the days of mass travel. And they wanted to be ensured that uh, you were going to stay a route. It took a long time to get you out there. Yeah. And they wanted to make sure that uh, you were going to be suitable and not uh, uh, be squeamish about the large insects or uh, go down with heat stroke at the uh, <laughs> the first set of the hot weather and um, yes and uh, and this was quite a, a a long procedure to get get the post I, I went for an interview and uh, I had lots of health checks uh, to make sure uh, x-rays and all sorts of things to uh, procedures which took I suppose the process before being accepted whereas in many interviews, you're accepted straight away. This took about a couple of months, and eventually they said, okay, yeah, we think you are the person for the job. And um, when I spoke to various people about this, it was my wife was to come as well. And when I spoke to various people about this, they thought um, they would never see me again, that it, it was I was going to go... Uh, 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 to get there, uh, sort of going through uh, rapids and on um, log rafts in order to get to some remote outpost in the jungle. And I had to say, well, it's not really quite so wild as what you imagine. There's a, a, a weekly flight, and that's how I get there. And <laughs> I was quite sort of taken aback by this. In fact, when I looked up on the plane for where Malawi was, and it's a very small country, it's landlocked, it's uh, uh, extremely poor, it's one of the poorest countries in Africa and still is, and um, most people, including myself, had never really heard of it, and uh, and so it was, I suppose, quite uh, uh, a, uh, a bold move, it seems, at the time when I went out there. Yeah, from the from your book, it sounded like you did quite a bit of research in advance as well. But I'm wondering, um, like when you actually got there, what was your impressions or your first experience? Because I'm, I'm sure it, it was still, even though you were reassuring people that this was a regular trip, uh, I'm mm. sure it was still quite different. We hear the much acclaimed uh, term about a culture shock, which I, I suppose it is, and leaving the grey skies of October England behind and arriving in the uh, at the start of their hot season before the rains came and everything was vivid in colour, the blue skies, the heat. The, uh, I noticed I can always remember coming from the airport. I was picked up from a member of the staff at my department and I uh, and everything was very colourful. The people were in bright coloured clothes, brilliant colours and the uh, whitewashed buildings contrasting with the red sand of the or, or red soil which have been um, in, in and the yellow grass after months of uh, uh, dry weather was was impressive and 
it, it always stays with you. So I think that was it was just the imaging which which caught my attention more more than anything. And uh, and and so I I suppose it was uh, this visual aspect of seeing the country was was what impressed me the most at that time. Right. I mean, I, I remember my first experience in the Middle East coming from Canada. And uh, for me, that, I mean, that's completely different from Africa. But I just um, remember being overwhelmed by brown. <laughs> so, yes. so like you say, the visual difference from what you're used to. Yeah. Yeah, so the brilliant sun. And I suppose anyone can say, well, they go to Spain and, uh, and that is going to be the uh, similar. And I suppose to some extent it was a brilliant blue sky. And uh, the uh, as a red the red soil a contrasting with the yellow grass which was burnt after months of continued dry weather, and I think this was something which uh, uh, um, was more impressive. And and of course, coming into Malawi from the plain, you could see the the blue of the Lake Malawi, which is I think the third largest. Uh, lake in Africa now, and uh, along it's along the Rift Valley, and uh, and you sweep over the uh, Lake Malawi before you land at uh, the capital city. So it was yes, it was the visual aspect which impressed me the most, and uh, and, and will always probably stay with me. And, and what was your wife's thought about going to Africa then? <laughs> Well, uh, I think she comes from Canada and uh, uh, and uh, and is used to um, well living in England. She came from Canada, living in England, and uh, I think she was um, quite uh, in quite overjoyed by by the fact of being in a, such an unusual place and uh, uh, and living in somewhere which uh, very few people at that time, the number of expatriates, there was more there than there was uh, in later years because there was more uh, uh, government help from um, Western countries going in. And, um, and, uh, but I would have to say that, that uh, women in, as wives in, uh, in Africa are, are possibly an endangered species. Uh, 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 they there's a tendency to be isolated or what I suppose the men are too uh, isolated from their uh, usual friends and family and so forth uh, but they they have a, a job to do whereas women have got very little with with house servants and most day-to-day -day routine things taken care of uh, it's uh, possibly uh, can be very culturally isolating and although they have their groups that they go to coffee mornings and uh, uh, an outdoor sporting life and and so on it, it is there's uh, while i was there i saw lots of um catastrophes with marriages breaking up because uh w women wanting to um they've had enough they, they, they they're isolated they not quite sure uh there's a continual flow of people coming in and going out, even though they're in fairly small numbers. So if it's not the permanent friendships are possibly much more difficult to establish. And a lot of uh, women did actually return. Uh, whereas I suppose for men, they, uh, although there again, um, the lax lifestyle meant that, uh, Drinking and parties used to be quite the common feature, and uh, a lot of men, uh, without the social uh, conditions to keep them on the rails, went off the rails while they was out there, and uh, uh, very often uh, succumbed to the, uh, the, the tropical nature of the place in the, taking off with um, uh, local women uh, and uh, having. Too much drinking, a lot of people became alcoholics. So I'm not saying that there's a sort of social disruption, but I think uh, relatively there is more 
disruption because of um, the isolation and the, the norms which keep people on the straight and narrow in the Western world. They've grown up with it and they uh, have got accustomed to their way of life. Suddenly all that disappears and they are in a, a country where they have to make friends uh, with people they've never seen before uh, and, uh, and it's a continual movement of people around and uh, uh, with very little else to do except a, a social life based around sporting activities, tennis and golf and so on uh, and a lot of um, house parties and, and such meant there was a, a, a much different style of life went on. So this is something which uh, uh, I, I refer to in my book about the, uh, the different nature of of society in right. uh, in in all uh, I suppose uh, expat countries. Mm. And do you think? Um, well, I don't know what kind of presence there is still there, but obviously there's at least embassies, I assume. But do you think uh, that situation has changed then much, uh, especially for the women, or uh, possibly not? Um, except, I would, um, I would say that there would be even fewer expatriates now, as as they left and and uh, the indigenous population took over those management jobs. Uh, they uh, that happened on, on a larger and larger scale. So the number of expats now in most African countries is is a lot smaller. That is in. I suppose the ones which came from their previous colonial background, Britain and, and Europe, now is being replaced by countries such as the Chinese, who are out there in large numbers to uh, uh, make infrastructure projects in return for uh, the minerals which are out there in abundance. So, um, uh, and they tend to keep very much. Uh, to themselves, uh, uh, although, uh, again, I suppose some of that uh, effect of a cultural separation does affect everyone, but the, perhaps the Chinese, are, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, uh, I did meet some of the, the Chinese out there who were building a railway to Dar es Salaam. Um, the ones out there now are usually mining uh, uh, and uh, building infrastructure projects and uh, and uh, and doing ore, ore and ore minerals because there's so many minerals in Africa and so the Chinese have, are out there in in certain countries in quite large numbers now. Mm -hmm. They are very rich lands, isn't it? Uh, resource. So I think it's I think it's um, although there's uh, 35 countries in Africa. And it takes up um, enormous amount of uh, of land space. Um, I'm not quite. Uh, uh, um, I, I think you can get China, uh, the United States, Canada, and most of Europe into the borders of of Africa. And if you it's coming from a from outer space, and you, and you we've seen pictures of, uh, of taken on satellites. Uh, Africa takes up almost the whole of one side of the uh, you know, of the globe. So, you know, an absolutely enormous place with uh, being about one to one point two billion people now, and uh, an enormous land mass. And so, um, yes, this is my introduction to to Africa. And uh, uh, I was on a contract basis, so any time that the uh, the government thought I was. Uh, uh, not doing what I was supposed to be doing, uh, then they they could turn me out of the country. And uh, especially in Malawi, which I had uh, at the time when I first went there, uh, and I, but I have been back many times in, in, the, in the past few years. Um, President Banda was in charge, and he was a very strict autocratic ruler, and he had very uh, firm ideas about uh, what he wanted done. And, and if people stepped out of line, there was no nonsense. You were either in jail or out of the country within 24 hours. It, it was that fast. Yeah. So there was, if anyone, you had spies everywhere. And if you 
uh, heard a report went back that you had criticized, just criticized or made a, a, a reference to something in his policies, which was not uh, to the liking of the government, that would get back. And even the trainees I had, there were party members in the group and uh, and they were keeping an eye on what I did. Spies, and if they, yeah. Yeah, yes, and, and, and I could have been out and I knew several people who had to get out very quickly. Uh, because uh, they had upset the regime in in some minor way. For instance, uh, a lot of there was an awful lot of Asians in in Malawi, and uh, I remember the wedding party once. Uh, um, someone turned off the radio when the president was giving a speech because it interfered with the music they were playing. Uh, they were out of the country yes. in the, the, within a few days. They had to leave. So uh, yes, it's um, that that was. It's a very uh, uh, unpredictable lifestyle in many ways, and you have to be careful with, and especially coming from the free democracy West, uh, uh, you, you can run into political problems quite easily uh, in a country where, where the norms are so different. Yeah, I think unpredictable is probably the, the word that summarizes our, our um, understanding of it from this side anyway as well, what we hear in the news and whatnot. Yes. Has that changed a lot? Do you think in the you were here? You were there in the seventies, so I mean, and also um, uh, I've been back on various occasions uh, in the last few, a couple of years ago. In fact, I was back in uh, in Malawi for a month, and uh, yeah. and you've seen a lot of change then. Yes, the autocratic uh, president gone, and of course they are, now they have this wonderful thing called democracy, yeah. and of course the. The, the the thing is that uh, it's not quite so wonderful. I think well now we're all going to be rich. It doesn't quite work that way. And uh, there's a lot of it was. It's a case of, uh, of uh, in the last elections, which I think were rigged, and they they're going to be taken again in Malawi in um, scheduled for June, I think. Uh, and uh, it's it's a case of there may be ten people up there for um, to. Uh, uh, opting for the posts and it's a case of choosing which one is the least corrupt yeah. of the people who are up for election and uh, I spoke to many people who were uh, they thought well when they once they got rid of uh, the exiting president uh, everything's going to be fine well of course it's, it wasn't that easy and, uh, and so uh, um, uh, they, they found that um, it's not didn't bring the promises and in fact a, a lot of corruption which is endemic in uh, in africa all, all over the, the countries uh and, and if it wasn't for a lot of corruption that the, the continent would be much richer than, than it is now i mean your your comment on loot choosing the uh the least corrupt uh often seems to represent us over here as well but do you think it's the the uh, underlying social structure or the political structure that sort of here it kind of it's protective to some degree anyway? Do you think mm. that's lacking um, that that protective nature of the of the political system over there? Yes, I I, I suppose it, it is. Um, I, I noticed it was two things which I think summarise the continent uh, very much in over in the last few weeks. Uh, our Present um, Prime Minister made a reference when there was a delegation from Africa coming in, but the, the Africa was the place of the future. It was economically going to be a powerhouse, and it was a country, a continent. Uh, Britain wanted to do more to promote trade links and to have more involvement with, uh, which showed the promise of what the what the continent has to offer yet at the same time and this is now about a month ago in angola which is an oil rich country on the uh, western side of the country uh president uh who was an outgoing the outgoing president of angola his daughter uh susha i think her name is had a uh, um is reputed to be the richest woman in Africa and has been involved in 
uh, creaming off much of the oil wealth and the mineral content uh, money and uh, uh, and and have it, and lived, I believe she lives in London and is having a, you know, a wonderful lifestyle and it represents the other half but uh, the corruption which goes on I did actually leave live in um, in Zambia after leaving leaving Malawi after uh, uh, two contracts there I went to um, live in Zambia and uh, in all Malawi was with such an autocratic system it was, it was fairly sort of clean living in, in, in regards to corruption. Zambia, which was more freewheeling, uh, had a, an incredibly corrupt system. Of, it was because of the drop in of the copper is one of the major, major exports. And, uh, um, uh, uh, and when the copper price dropped, it didn't have an infrastructure of other commodities to fall back on. And there was shortages of just about everything which you, you could imagine. And queues used to form in the cities to get scarce goods and so on. And if you wanted anything, uh, there, there was um, uh, always people who could get hold of it for you for a price. Mm. And, uh, and that included currency. Uh, even when, uh, I have to admit this, when I went to... Um, uh, Zambia in the first place, the, uh, I, I was given a loan for a car and the bank manager, a European man, suggested, well, don't bring it in through the bank here. Use the money changes because they will give you four times the rate. And, uh, and it's all manners of stories like this, which you can relate about the way in which currency manipulation took place. Right, the, general the, corruption of the system, basically. Yes, and, and everyone was involved in it. It seemed to be... Uh, that uh, even the, the missionaries who run the uh, mission stations in the country used to use this system because it wasn't tenable having a, an exchange rate which was so low when uh, with, without any effort at all you could use the money changes and, uh, and they would uh, uh, give you four times the amount that you get for it. So that, that is part of the problem as well, the incredible amount of corruption everywhere in just about every country you can think of right um we had a question actually and uh as someone was just wondering what was the what, was, what did you do there what was the what was your position oh yes i was in malawi i was um a training officer in the government printing office that was my my background is in uh, uh composition uh of books and magazines and i was out there to uh make sure a training scheme was set up uh, and and people got. Uh, I was doing the Ethereum uh, side of it, but I also used to organise the practical uh, system where they went through and make sure they weren't just cheap labour, but we but we were picking up the skills as they went along. And so uh, uh, this was my time then. But and, and uh, uh, eventually, of course, someone took over from me, and. Uh, uh, but as I left in Zambia, it was something a little bit different. Uh, they were in, it was a lot of money around at the, at the time. Uh, as it already said about uh, the amount of copper which the, which Zambia has, and they were introducing computerized uh, typesetting equipment. Mm, okay. And I was sent with someone else on a it was state of the art material on a training course to learn about setting this. Uh, this material up and uh, when I got out there uh, the the equipment had come through Luanda I think it was on the uh, on the west coast and it and because there was war going on there it had been bombed in the harbour and only half of it actually uh, it went through the Benguela railway to Zambia uh, and uh, to Lusaka where I was working and only half of it arrived and so uh, you know, the purpose of the job never, never really took off. I was just using, ended up just using the older equipment, yeah, yeah. and the new new material just never arrived. So, did your um your experience with with printing and whatnot uh, come into play when you when you prepared your book, or or did you just or did you get this like right from a publisher? Uh, yes, it 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 was through um, Dovetail Press who. Uh, uh, who who printed it. I, I actually, in order to save costs and uh, 
to um, to offset the expense, I actually did the I had it edited, but I did all the typesetting myself. Made it. It was made up with uh, with just Microsoft Word uh, into pages, and um, uh, and I constructed the book myself. Used my own photographs for it, and uh, and then it went online to a printer who then put the whole thing together, and uh, so it's very much a combined effort. Yeah, I guess it's quite a nice book, good quality paper as well. Uh, well, um, I, I wanted, I, you could cut down the cost of it quite a bit, but I figured, well, that's true, and I didn't want to have the price too high so that no one bought it, uh, uh, because eventually it just reflects you, and uh, if something looks cheap, then it's always going to look cheap, but uh, if mm. it's something which has got a quality feel to it, it's going to reflect on you, I think, a little bit that way. Right. And can you talk about a little bit about um, just sort of very briefly, because we had a question about uh, to summarize your book and as, as it would put, why, why should I buy this book, for example? <laughs> well, I think um, uh, there's few expatriates uh, uh, relative to the local population. The population is, is, is vast and the number of expatriates out there is very small. Um, and, uh, and I was able to travel a lot and go to places which the normal tourists don't go to. They usually go to game parks and to beach resorts. Yet I could travel, uh, had the opportunity to travel by any means uh, I wanted to, by local bus or, or by car when I had one there. And um, went to places that normally people don't go to. I mean, there's, there's late steamers and trains and, and all sorts. Uh, uh, like you find everywhere else, but the experience of traveling by local transport is quite, is quite extraordinary. And the amount of time and effort it takes to take journeys into the interior uh, means that most people actually don't get that far. And so therefore it gives, and, and foreign correspondents very often just get flown in for a war or for a, uh, some particular political event, and then they get flown back out again. I'm not saying that that doesn't give uh, credence to what they go to report, but I was living there for uh, you know, for, for more than 10 years and was able to sort of summarize and digest the things that I saw going on. So this is a this is not so much about me, it's about what I saw happening yes. uh, in, in the country as a whole. And that, that's, that's why I think it's... Uh, mm -hmm. Important to um, what, what makes a book, I think, of some value. Uh, and also, um, I've divided it into chapters so that if you wanted to read about villages, it's, it's a chapter on those, and, and transport would be another chapter. So that you could pick up without, not like a novel, you've got to start at page one and go through to page 150. Whereas in my book, you could read one chapter, which would be complete in itself. And, and choose and you can choose chapter four and then go to chapter ten and there's a continuity get kind of whatever experience you want yes book, yes indeed indeed so uh, and especially I think transport takes up a big chunk of, of one of the chapters uh, because it's so uh, the experiences of, of going around by by local bus either in the cities or cross country is quite a I won't say daunting, but you'd have to be on a learning curve to be able to accept some of the things that, that uh, just went on. Uh, yeah, I can so imagine. Crowded. <laughs> you, the only way you get on them would be maybe to come in through the windows, there'd be chickens and inside with stacks of maize, and you would be sitting alongside all the local villagers, and, uh, uh, and the buses would often break down. they get bogged down in the mud and so on and you have to get out and push them out and so the, but that's what you go to Africa for you don't want it's so organized in this in the western world <laughs> and that's what you, what you want to escape from <laughs> so did you have the difficulty readjusting then coming back yes I think so I think it's not so much that you um, uh, take some of the country away with you but you leave some of yourself there. 
and uh, I've got many colleagues um, uh, who, who I regularly correspond with um, by the marvels of the modern phone, and um, and and because obviously I understand the position they're in and and the kind of life they lead, I I can. Uh, communicate much more easily. Uh, I think it's all very well reading about something in the newspapers and, uh, and thinking um, well, this is good or this is terrible or whatever. Um, w when you understand the, the background to the way people live, uh, um, then uh, that has a, a much more important aspect of, of the life. When I was there the last time, which is a couple of years ago, went to see some colleagues I know in, in one of the villages and and they're just typical villages with with uh, mud blocks and grass roofs. Mm -hmm. And so to make tea it was um, not going to the the cooker. There was no cooker, but a local a little fire in the village compound to brew the um, the tea on and, uh, and um, may, maybe some people would find this uh, and uh, very difficult and to adjust to but I'd been in villages before and I knew what to expect and uh, would be there would be very little I'd be um, uh, would be uh, uh, thrown by mm. but I did have of course on the on my computer I don't know but we need too many pictures, but, but uh, I, I do have some perhaps, perhaps talking about things is, is enough, but uh, I do have some pictures, which unfortunately I think we're, we're almost out of time now. Um, uh, oh yes. I'm just looking at the top. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so. laughs> goes by. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think we're going to, we'll end it there. I think I've answered the uh, sort of gone through the questions already, but um mm -hmm. I would definitely like to, to chat again, especially you said you've been in travel through India as well. And uh, I'd love to compare notes because uh, my yes. wife and I were in India yes, about 15 indeed. years ago. And uh, it was an interesting yes, experience yes. as well. <laughs> well. I think you could go on talking about uh, Africa for a long time. Um, uh, it's a big world, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yes. And, um, um, and you have been inexhaustible amount of um, material. Um, I, I just I, one one of the things I just very quickly was thinking about the uh, uh, traveling on the the mini buses around uh, Lusaka. They uh, they uh, are horrendous things to, and they do long distances as well. And uh, uh, the people get on crowded in these things, which are mm. desperately overloaded, and they very rarely come to a stop to pick up passengers. They sort of hoovered in and uh, so that they can get to the destination quick enough to actually turn around and get come back again and when they break down you often see uh, these minibuses on the side of the road um, uh, uh, they're jacked up on stones and everything is stripped off to make the repair and they rise phoenix like uh, from from the, the remnants of where they were uh, just enough attention to make them serviceable again and they roar off swaying in, as on broken springs and and uh, into a, 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 a sort of a, into the traffic flow again to get that last yeah, um, yeah. dollar but the, but the, but the driver needs so much <laughs> um, so I think we're, we'll have to end it there but um, I want to give you one more chance to sort of plug your books and uh, yes. if you have a website or anything like that, or yes. where it can be found. Yes, you can. Um, uh, Waiting for the rains is uh, uh, can be bought through uh, um, Dovetail Press, uh, and it's uh, available on Amazon. Um, the incident at Barbers Ridge is a book about a, a conflict in Africa, which of course there seems to be one going on somewhere, all over, uh, someplace all over, and it's about what I what I saw in a conflict situation, and it's, so it's a it's it is fiction, but it's based on fact. Oh, well, thanks very much. Thanks again it's for been joining a pleasure. us. Okay, nice speaking to you, Edwin. And you. And you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. <laughs>